everyone. Welcome. We're fulfilling the commitments for Beijing Plus 25. Today we'll be talking about women in the media, and we're going to be led by UN Women's very own Sharon Carter Burke. We're excited for this session for many reasons. One, because Sharon Carter Burke is a communications analyst at UN Women, multi-country office in the Caribbean. She is a trained broadcast journalist. She's been working in the communications industry for over 26 years. And I have to say, not only within these 26 years has she worked for UN Women, but on her 24th year, she was a youth delegate to the 1995 Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing as a member of the Barbados government delegation. Sharon began her career at one of Barbados's leading media houses, working first with the Barbados Rediffusion Services Limited, now Starcom Network, and then in print journalism at the Nation Publishing Company. She made the transition to corporate communications within a health and environmental project unit of the Ministry of Health of Barbados, continuing in this field into the startup communications position of a national agency established to improve Barbados's service delivery. When UN Women decentralized communications to the field offices, she was the first communications officer appointed to the Caribbean office from 2010. So that means Sharon actually was here at the time at which UN Women transitioned from UNIFEM to UN Women, and she has held this post up until now. Sharon's responsibilities include developing awareness and advocacy initiatives to share UN Women's mandate and programmatic work with the general public, governmental and non-governmental partners. Sharon's responsibilities also include supporting UN Women in ensuring its internal communications are reflective of language that actually resonates with the general public. Sharon has a long history of working in support of women's empowerment and gender equality, including, as I mentioned before, as the IDB Barbados Youth Delegate to the 1995 Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, as she was a member of the Barbados government delegation. And I like to repeat that as much as possible because we get to see how we are all parts of living history. Sharon received her training in broadcast journalism from Ryerson University in Canada and also holds a MSc in project management and evaluation from the University of the West Indies, Cavill campus, where she earned a distinction. So today we're going to be looking at women in the media. Usually I go through what the objectives of the sessions are, but I believe that in Sharon's presentation, she already addresses this. So I'm not going to repeat what you're already going to be hearing. So Sharon, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks so much, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Are you hearing me okay? Great. So we'll go right into the presentation. I'm going to go through the presentation and then invite you to a discussion at the end. Um, there are some points where I may ask a few questions that you can type in some responses, but pretty much prefer to go through the presentation and then we'll get into a hearty discussion. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So the objectives of this module is we want to look and see what the international frameworks say about women in the media. We want to examine what are the critical issues that, we're, that are still confronting women in the media. And we want to look at what progress has been made um, in terms of some research that has been done in the Caribbean. And then we also want to look at what your country reports. Um, I think someone has their mic open. And lastly, colleagues, we're going to look at the question of how do we engage more effectively with the media. Um, why do we want to look at working with the media or how women are represented in the media? It's because media are change makers. They are social influencers. They disseminate our messaging to the public. They can provide a voice and platform to empower women and put critical issues on the political agenda. So recognizing this, uh, several of our international frameworks have included a section on women in the media. And as you're aware, the Beijing Platform for Action recognize the potential of the media to make a far greater contribution to the advancement of women and outline two strategic areas um, on which we note the progress still at this point in time has been very slow. It's to, they've 
they pointed to increasing the participation and access of women to expression and decision making in and through media and new technologies and communications, and to promote a balanced and non-stereotype portrayal of women in the media. If we look at CEDAW, in its rec general recommendations, it too calls on states to adopt and implement effective measures to ensure that the media respect and promote respect for women by adopting self-regulatory mechanisms, including for online or social media to eliminate gender stereotyping, relating to both women and men, to specific groups of women, for example, human rights defenders, to address gender-based violence against women, and to create guidelines for the appropriate coverage by the media of cases of GBV against women. Similarly, at the regional level, the Belém do Pará requires states' parties to undertake specific measures, including programs, to encourage the communications media to develop appropriate media guidelines to contribute to the eradication of violence against women in all its forms, and to enhance respect and dignity for women. So the Beijing Platform for Action asks you to look at certain things when you're reporting, and some of the critical issues they raise around, it raises around women in the media, is this problem of the continued projection of negative and degrading images of women, whether it's through electronic, print, visual, and audio, and some of you noted this in your country reports. Um, if everyone has not had the opportunity to go online and read the Caribbean country reports, please, please ensure that you do so, certainly um, if you're going to be participating in any of the fora, but also in terms of for your information and for your messaging as you continue to do your work in your countries. Um, another critical issue that was raised was that Print and electronic media in most countries do not provide a balanced picture of women's diverse lives and contributions to society, and we'll see that when we go into what the Caribbean research shows us. Um, it notes that the programming can reinforce the women's traditional roles, which would be limiting to where women can go and self-actualize in society. And then also this worldwide trend towards consumerism created a climate in which advertisements and commercial messages portray women primarily as consumers and target women and girls of all ages inappropriately. Um, we, we, the, the Beijing Platform for Action notes that more women are involved in careers in communication sector, but they are not equally represented at the decision-making level. They don't serve on the governing boards and bodies that influence media policy where these boards exist. And some of you have also noted in your country reports that there isn't, that these boards have not yet been established. And that's some of the work that you need to do if you want to support uh, making the media more gender aware and responsive. Uh, the lack of gender sensitivity in the media the Beijing Platform for Action Notes is evidenced by the failure to eliminate the gender-based stereotyping that can be found in public and private, local, national, and international media organizations. And it's felt that if more women were in the decision-making positions, we would start to see a change, a much more critical change in this regard. The global picture, these are some facts that UN women um, curated and shared during CSW last year, and uh, based on the research, are still quite relevant. So if you look at these little infographics, you will see that it says, when you look at the news coverage, um, only 9% of the stories really go into or examine gender equality or inequality issues. Um, only 4% of stories clearly challenge gender stereotypes. When you listen to the news, only one in four people felt they'd heard or read any news about um, women. And then in terms of the jobs, women only hold 27% of top management jobs in media organizations. Uh, if we want to go deeper into the Caribbean in terms of the profile in the workplaces, we're going to have to, somebody's going to have to fund some research in that regard because it hasn't been done on that deep level 
across media organizations. But one tool we have or one program we have that we can suggest if you're working along with your media organizations in your countries are the UN Women and UN Global Compact Women's Empowerment Principles, the WEPs. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard of these, and some of you are working in projects with us under the WEPs. Certainly, our Jamaica counterpart should be aware of the WEPs through our win-win program. And the WEPs has um, tools that guide companies to measure um, how they rate in terms of gender equality, and also to give them guidelines on how they can improve in this regard and make their workplaces more accessible to women across all jobs, certainly in, in senior management. So now we're going to turn and look at what some of the Caribbean statistics say about gender and the media. I hope that you've heard about the Global Media Monitoring Project before. Um, there, are some, there were some stories online. There was a presentation, um, certainly in Antigua and Barbuda, on the Global Media Monitoring Project and Alexandrina Wong, not seeing her online, but she was also quoted in one of the stories commenting on the absence of women in media. The Global Media Monitoring Project is the world's longest running and most extensive research on gender in the news media. And this is um, an, a moment where volunteers around the world monitor women's presence in their national radio, television, and print news. They use a comprehensive and standardized methodology around the world, and the Caribbean has participated in every one of these since 1995. Um, WMW Jamaica, formerly known as Women's Media Watch, was the regional coordinator in 2010 and 2015, and they're also coordinating the 2020 study. In fact, Hillary Nicholson has reached out to us in terms of engaging young women NGOs in Barbados to support with this 2020 exercise, and that those women will be trained to conduct this survey on the specific date um, that is held in 2020. So the last set of research presented was in 2015, and that research covered 15 Caribbean nations. Um, over 120 newspapers, radio and television stations. You see now it's been expanded to include internet um, news sites and Twitter as well. Um, that research showed that of the seven main categories of news, the areas most covered were domestic politics on that specific day. On that, remember, this is on a specific day. Uh, was domestic politics, the economy, social and legal issues. Um, and they noted, um, interestingly enough, that unlike previous studies, crime and violence did not dominate Caribbean news on that day. But they also noted that across the region, progress towards gender equality and communications rights has been advanced as well as hindered by the news media. And they noted that some examples of where there were advances were the few codes of practice that were um, present, at me that were in place at media houses, which take into account issues of gender-based, gender and violence. And the Barbados-based CPDC uh, created, a, in that exercise for the 2015 initiative, they created a Barbados Media Code of Ethical Practice on Gender and lobbied media houses for its adoption. Their participation was, in fact, funded by WMW Jamaica, and I've included the link to access this uh, code of ethics that persons can refer to afterwards. Um, you can share with your media managers if you have the opportunity to do so. There, there's also going to be a list of resources for you at the end of the presentation. Um, so the, the, the research showed that only 17% of new subjects, the people who were interviewed or whom the news is about were women only 17%, looking pretty much like the global picture. So who appears in the news as we go deeper into that research? Men are featured 2.5 times more than women. So you see men 72% of the time covered in the news versus 28% of the time um, for women. Primarily, male government officials are the newsmakers. 
It's mostly male voices that are heard when you come to talking about who are spokespeople for organizations and experts on topics 73, 71, and 73% respectively. Women, on the other hand, are three times more likely than men to be described in terms of family relationships. So women are mentioned as spouse, as mother, as opposed to in their individual professional and expert capacity. Who's delivering the news? 46% of those who delivered the news were women and 54% were men. It was noted that presenters on television were more likely to be women and perhaps there's a gender dimension to that that can be explored, while on radio more presenters were men. Among reporters, both female and male, covered news on the economy, politics and government, and on the social and legal issues. However, science and health were more often covered by females, while crime and violence was more often covered by males. Uh, one country in their uh, Beijing 25 report noted also that women are fairly represented as anchors in TV and radio, but they are in the minority in decision-making positions. As we look further at that data, uh, we note that despite the fact that women constitute just over half the population in the Caribbean, only 15% of the stories included women as a central focus, and this was mainly in news on crime and violence. 18% of stories made reference to gender equality, inequality, human rights, or related policies, and then you would see uh, slightly more females, as more women and girls as the news subjects. Um, and they noted that this was an 18% increase on the previous study, which would have been in 2010. Um, in terms of challenging or reinforcing gender stereotypes, nearly one in 10 stories definitely challenged stereotypes, which was another improvement. In general, the sex of the reporter did not, on average, affect the particular dimensions of the news stories. And something, um, I want, as I said, I would ask you some questions in between, and you can type in the chat box. Does your organization monitor the media on a systematic basis? Um, do you comment on some stories, some editorials? Do you in any way engage um, before articles may come out or after they've come out to look and see how they're doing the reporting? There is a group of young women who went through a transformational women's leadership course um, some years back, and one of the outputs was that they created a Facebook page to monitor Caribbean media. And I want to encourage you to follow Walking Into Walls. They look specifically at stories related to gender-based violence all across the Caribbean. And one question or one comment they are consistently making is that news reports continue to speak about men having sex with girl children. And we know that this is, in fact, not the case, it cannot be referred to as having sexual intercourse, it is in fact rape, and that people need to ad address it by what it is if we are to stop normalizing these behaviors and call perpetrators to account. So I want to encourage you to, to follow Walking Into Walls. There are some others who do uh, monitoring of the media, it's uh, Code Red. They have um, in the past done similar media monitoring beyond GBV. Um, they've even commented on advertisements where women were being objectified and have in fact had the success of having an advert pulled. That report from the Global Media Monitoring Project suggests some action that could be taken. And it said, in order to move forward, there needs to be greater gender awareness training for professionals in the news media, um, for media managers, because remember the decision-making level is where you need to be making the impact, not just the reporters who um, change quite frequently. Some of you may, may recognize this through your relations with the media, that reporters come in and out of the industry and that, in fact, you need to keep, if you're doing training or engaging with them, you need to continue to do this on a sustained basis if you're to continue to reach the new people 
who are coming in and certainly decision makers to get the change we want to see. We need to reach out to the broadcast regulators to do gender awareness training so that they too, as they are monitoring the media and not just the news media, but uh, DJs and so on, that we're getting much more gender responsive broadcasting. They've also recommended gender equality guidelines be included in editorial policies and broadcasting standards, codes of practice. Um, they're saying that uh, media activists or gender activists and advocates you need to collaborate more strategically to ensure that work on gender equality of the media with the media has a lasting impact. And they're also saying we need to more effectively use this data from the Global Media Monitoring Project um, because it's telling us how women are being covered in the media, how women are being treated, how women are being described, how women are being viewed, and the extent to which it continues to reinforce inequalities and limit women. And this is evidence that we can use to make the case um, that we need to make for change. And then they also mention awards. Um, through recognizing those journalists who are gender aware, who are gender responsive, and who are doing um, specific columns or have programs on air um, that are concerned with working and in support of actors in their countries for gender equality, you need to recognize these people. You need to let people see who's doing what in a positive way and so that they can be an example and an encouragement for others to move in this regard as well. And some of you have, have addressed those critiques as well in your country reports. So what do your country reports say about women in the media? Some of the issues that you point to are that women and girls are often presented through a narrow stereotypical lens. You comment on objectification of women in the media and you go beyond the news as we've been discussing. You look at uh, singers, you look at people who write songs and the songs are quite derogatory about women, particularly during our carnival time. Um, there are songs that we're, we're forced to go on air, go to the same media and say this is not appropriate. Um, look at what you're saying about women. Look at, the, uh, at some of the dangers you might be encouraging for women when they go to parties. Look at how you're saying that women don't have autonomy over their body. And then sometimes you have to go to the same media management and demand that these songs be pulled from air. Um, there are always going to be those people who are going to talk about creativity and that the, perhaps the artist did a mean harm. They were really just um, being complimentary and saying how important women and girls are and how much they love them. No, we have to cut through this and say um, it's not cultural, it's not complimentary, it's not um, about digging up women. What it is doing is reinforcing harmful stereotypes and it is putting women in danger because we know the influence of culture um, on societies and that the bigger the artists, the bigger the following and the more dedicated people are to what they're saying, following this and believing it and, and you're hearing it playing over and over again, it, it starts to take over and it becomes for you something that's normal and perhaps is the way it should be because so-and-so is singing about it. But however, we still have to be careful that when um, we take a stand against a particular song or so on, that we choose, that we're careful in our choice. So it should be something that is um, beyond the pale. There are some instances where some artists will step over the line and perhaps a quieter word with them and their production companies can make a change as opposed to if you do a full on, um, uh, criticism of the song where then the message of what you are saying is lost to the general public and you don't have people on your side and then when the time comes when there is a song that's really outrageous and you want to go and make the case ab about that then people say oh gosh it's you again you seem to, to not want anybody to sing anything and make money so you still have to think about um, which, at what times will you make that stand? And that's not to say don't make a stand, just be very selective and strategic in the stand that you make. Um, the country reports also went on to look at what were some of the steps that you've taken to 
counter the discrimination and gender bias in the media and to address the portrayal of women and girls. And a couple countries noted that they had either passed or amended their Electronic Crimes Act. And certainly we know um, cyberbullying and stalking and child abuse and so on has been amplified with technology and that we've had to um, respond in kind to ensure that uh, the clear message goes out that there's zero tolerance to this and that there will be punishment where it is found. Um, some of you spoke about training media professionals on specific topics as you rolled out programs or campaigns. You spoke about human trafficking, you spoke about child abuse, the Break the Silence campaigns, you spoke about your VAW campaigns, um, particularly during 16 days and other high visibility moments. You spoke about HPV, human papilloma virus, um, doing work in that regard and training the media. And one of you in your, one of the countries in their reports noted the, that having gone through media training, the media has since become a significant ally in the work to end GBV. Many persons who have been trained are advocates in their own settings, including radio and television personalities. And another example is the uh, visibility around the Orange Days in some of your countries and the He for She campaign, where we, when we did an outreach to media houses to say get on board, some media houses in Trinidad and Tobago did get on board um, with the Orange Day, oranging their studios, wearing the orange, and sharing with us um, evidence of their advocacy on the given day. Uh, one of your country reports noted that where there was an absence of a regulatory board for the media, some CSOs made their complaints directly with the media house. They didn't just let it stand because there was not the official board um, to bring a complaint to. They made their complaints known directly to media houses, and that's something that you can consider, and you can do that by way of a letter. You can do that by way of if you are able to make a courtesy call on the media house, if you're able to meet, have a meeting with the manager. Um, if you don't get one with the managing editor, certainly someone who's in a, in a senior position who can make a difference. And uh, some of you pointed to media alliances, and this is something UN Women also tries to do, uh, form partnerships with the media. Um, you noted it particularly during your moments of peak visibility, the same 16 days, International Women's Day, Orange Day, etc. Um, you can consider if you have a big enough program, um, or when you're introducing your national gender policies or national action plans against GBV, if you want to do some kind of an alliance, some kind of partnership with the media where you agree to X number of stories or X number of um, articles over a period of time, and you make sure that you honor that agreement and you're providing information that's being carried on a sustained basis, and you also in there recognize the media partnership. So you're not just giving your message on how you're working towards women's empowerment and gender equality, but you're also recognizing that this um, organization has come on board as a partner, signaling that they are committed to realizing gender equality in their country and that they recognize that if gender equality is not realized, that their societies can't fully reach their potential, individuals can't reach their full potential. And so it's important to recognize those partnerships. Some other ways that you pointed out to initiatives that you've taken is you did panel discussions or you held other fora highlighting non-traditional areas of work for women to get into, including media management. Um, because you know when we do the sectoral studies, women tend to be clustered in particular sectors, particular areas of work, and not necessarily the high-paying ones. And in fact, UN Women will launch a report in this regard tomorrow. And we will, of course, invite the media to be there, and we will make the case of why there's need for gender equality and why women need to have equal opportunity and access in all areas of work. Um, and we will share that with you across our website and social media space and perhaps by direct email as well. Um, one other area, some other areas that you highlighted is that you have, in fact, 
try to establish free Wi-Fi hubs in the more internal or remote parts of your countries to ensure that women and girls have access to information. Um, you've done social media training or you've done ICT training to ensure that women and girls can get into these areas of jobs. Um, UN Women and its research continues to point out that, you know, in some years to come, women and girls will be in jobs that have not even yet been thought of, but we need to stimulate their participation and their interest in these different areas. Of course, uh, when we start to use technology, we have to be careful as well. And if you look to the left of the screen, you'll see a publication that UN Women has produced towards an end to sexual harassment, the urgency and nature of change in the era of Me Too. And so this looks at the fact that while technology has allowed us to create movements and partnerships across countries, it's also problematic in the sense that it fuels the trafficking of women, cyberbullying, and other new forms of violence. And so we note that women have grasped the power of technology and social media to expose the harm and pain they've experienced, um, but at the same time, um, that technology can come back to bite. Um, the publication notes that through technology, the Me Too movement has built a community of survivors from all walks of life by bringing vital conversations about sexual, sexual violence into the mainstream. We're helping to destigmatize survivors by highlighting the breadth and impact sexual violence has had on thousands of women, and we're helping those who need it to find entry points to healing. And some of these hashtags may be familiar to you. Uh, Me Too, Ni Unia Menos, with you six, Life in Leggings, which is Caribbean, and Street Harassment JA. And Street Harassment JA, we saw that this year where an NGO um, did this initiative in partnership with one of the Jamaica radio stations, RJR, and a very highly regarded female host, Dion Jackson Miller, where people uh, came online to express what had happened to them in, in, in regard to this hashtag, the street harassment that they experienced, why they think they experienced it, what were some of the things that said, how are they able to cope with it. Um, so we do, as the Beijing Platform for Action was very good to look forward to, recognize that technology would change and would take us into new spaces, but we have to be careful of the harm and capitalize on the positive aspects. So we turn our attention now to how do we engage more effectively with the media, and there are several resources out there um, available to us already, and then there are some initiatives that we're going to discuss um, and learn from each other on what can be done. Um, UN Women has recently published this handbook on addressing violence against women in and through the media, and in it they too um, go through the different steps um, of how you can encourage the media, and, and there's also a section where they speak about awards um, for media personnel who are already on the road or are committed to working towards gender equality. So one of the first things we need to think about is developing messaging that is accessible to the audiences. So you need to know who you're talking to and how do you say it in a way that it resonates with them, that it has meaning for them, that it means a difference in their daily real life. Um, and that when we go to these international fora and we return and we give our, our country press briefings, we have to uh, share the information in a way that people know that yes, our country went, we signed in support of these particular outcomes, and this is how the country will be looking at trying to implement them. Um, you, you can be honest and say what the challenges are, where you will have some gaps with, uh, that you will need support on, but you also identify for people their role um, in making the difference, in making the change, and you identify beforehand too in your organizations, whether government or NGO or even as individuals, Who's that person who's going to be speaking to the media? Um, what do you need to do to support them? Do you need to write talking points for them at every stage? How did you choose this person? 
Do they have a strong personality that people listen to, people drawn to them? Are they representing the message that you want to share? Um, or do they detract from what you're talking about? So you need to think about these things as well. And you know, need to know your media spaces. So already in your countries, you should be aware of which media personalities or which media houses or which spaces online champion gender equality and women's empowerment. And I want to tell you, and I'm sure a lot of you know, um, that your government information services departments are very key partners now. They've um, made incredible investments in technology and human resources. They have revamped websites. They do live streaming of some events. They produce video shorts and press releases in very real time of an event um, or, or press action happening. And they're even a source of information for private media houses who may not have all the resources to cover all the events that are going on in the country. So do get to know your government information services. They usually have an officer assigned by ministry or perhaps by area. And you can invite them um, if you if you are hosting an event, um, you're not a government person and you're hosting an event, but you will have a government official there, you can make that known to your GIS. Don't just wait on the government's um, office itself to do this. You, you reach out to them and you give them information on the events that's coming up and the government officer and you work with them to see that you can get that coverage. You need to make allies in the media. So some of you mentioned that you did training with journalists when you were working on specific campaigns. Do you maintain those relationships? Do you continue to train, offer training? Do you continue to offer them information and education so that their support goes beyond the campaign and becomes a sustained action for their media house? Do you continue to provide them with data and news? Do you say to them, we've developed some public service advertisements. How can we partner with you to get them on air? And sometimes those partnerships will not mean um, paying. Um, it, will, it could perhaps be where you give them recognition in other spaces, and they agree to make some time available to you, you know, good um, CSR. Do you encourage your media contacts to reach out to you, um, not just when you have a high visibility moment, but to reach out to you all through the year? Do you make your, your spokespersons available to them beyond that high visibility moment so that it is a two-way partnership and not just you reaching out to the media when it suits you, um, and then when they're calling to get information or comments um, when something has occurred, you, you are hiding from them. Now, not everything you will be able to comment on, um, and sometimes the response is, we are not able to comment on that particular situation owing to X sensitivity or so on. But in that way, you have um, responded and communicated with them, and you have not left them in the lurch trying to find out what's going on. As I noted before, you can make media alliances for these campaigns, for the 16 days of activism, for the orange days. You can do courtesy calls on the media. So in this photo on the left, this is the new resident coordinator for Barbados and the OECS, Didier Trabuc. And he's gone down, he went down to the Nation Publishing House, where he's meeting with the, in this photo, the managing director, Ms. Carol Martindale, um, who came through the ranks of reporter, editor, daily news editor, and is now the big boss at the leading uh, publishing house in Barbados. And on his return from the recent UNGA, he made a point to go down and to meet with Ms. Martindale. He used the opportunity of the world turning its attention to the woman prime minister of Barbados, uh, the Honorable Mia Motley, and how well received her speech was at the UNGA. And he used that moment to go down to the nation and to speak about what the UN would be doing in partnership with Barbados and other Eastern Caribbean countries, and has cultivated a relationship in the sense that just this weekend, the Nation News had an exclusive interview with him, which they also featured on their Instagram page. They featured on their Facebook. So it's not just their printed newspaper now where they are. Um, sharing, they're in the different spaces where all of us are as well. Um, you can negotiate with the media houses to write columns or blogs um, 
Emma Lewis, Pachari's blog, Emma Lewis in Jamaica. Um, she writes columns for newspapers. She's a very active blogger, and she's also on Twitter. Jamaican Twitter is incredible, um, and if you have the opportunity to follow some of them, you, you can learn um, some strategies that you can implement as well. Um, of course, you'll need the human resource to keep up with the social media spaces, but do try to find some time to do it. Um, if you look, these media personalities are also using their personal platforms to further share information from their news organizations. They use their personal Facebook page to tell us when something urgent is happening in the country. So they use their personal following. So if you are able to engage in that space with them as well, you get to take advantage of their personal following, not just the media house, to, to, to further share your information. Sometimes you're going to have to pay for placement. Um, not everybody has the budget for this or is able to do this on a regular basis, but you can make that decision based on how significant the information is that you need to get out. Because you know that just because you're a minister or a very important activist or so speaking about women and gender equality, you're not necessarily guaranteed a good place um, in the newspaper. It could be a very small story in one of the days, the light days, um, when they're just looking for fodder to fill the pages, sometimes you need to pay for placement to bring attention to a critical issue, and you, and you think about that in your work planning. Um, if you are a writer or you have writers within your organization with the necessary checks and reviews and approvals, perhaps you can start blogs, including video blogs, and you can share your information in that way. We had a former regional director who presented to you very early on in this series, Roberta Clark, oh, she had this incredible blog um, where it was written in very conversational language that anyone could follow. But she spoke about very serious issues, and she spoke about important partners, and she spoke about barriers, and she spoke about getting around them. Um, that's a strategy that you can engage in, um, and you'll be surprised that the media will also follow you in these spaces. The, the, the media in Jamaica follow uh, plenty of the activists on Twitter, because sometimes that's where they get their storylines as well. So these are spaces that you can think about. And something else to think about, joint government and CSO or NGO statements. These can be incredibly powerful. It shows unity. It shows commitment. It shows how serious you are to the issue that you're putting across. And it shows that you are not um, at each other's throats. It says that you're working together on an issue and that you are committed to seeing a positive change. So think about the times when you can do joint statements. This does not say that you can't then continue on with your individual advocacy and messaging and working with the media, but there are times when a joint statement can be very powerful. And I spoke about walking into Wall's Facebook page before, and, now I, re and I really want to encourage you um, to Follow that page and amplify the message in your countries where you can and speak to the media houses about how they're covering GBV, how they're covering um, rape of children, how they're covering the court cases, how they're covering cases where they say the woman who is the victim made the man so angry so he had to do X, Y, and Z, and you see that in headlines. Um, and, and let's have those critical discussions with the media managers about how they're covering these stories and how um, we can improve, uh, we can get them to change from these um, harmful presentations and, and to be more positive and supportive in the work. And I, I, just before I close out, I want to encourage you to, to think about how you're going to engage with the media as part of your annual work planning. So don't just, as something is coming up, think you can just call any media real quick or write something real quick. It doesn't work like that. You need to be strategic. You need to be thinking about what you're talking about, who's going to hear it, who do you need to be the spokesperson that, that the majority of people will listen to, and which media, sometimes which media house do you engage with that will get that attention um, that you want. So I'm basically wrapping up the presentation now. I'm going to open for discussion. This is just a list of some of the resources that are available 
to you that can support you in your work with around women in the media and, and getting our media organizations to establish codes of practice and so on. And you'll see that a couple of them are UN Women Produce. There's one from UNICEF, which speaks about our children, our media. And UNICEF recently held a training session for the media on how to cover children in disasters. So these are things that you can follow and be aware of and be a part of and then monitor and, and make sure that the media is making that change. So this is just a quote from Tina Brown. Um, I think some of you may know her in the US, Huffington Post. Um, for me, it's always been about telling stories. There's a powerful global women's movement going on, and there's an inexhaustible cast of brave and fascinating women whose stories I feel it's our mission to tell. So that's the end of my presentation. Let's, let's get to talking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. And now the floor is open to all of you to ask your questions. I see there are some comments as well. Twitter is now used to engage personal, uh, I'm not sure, personal is used via media houses and people's personal pages. Yes, Sharon, so true. And they use it as part of their topics. This is from Lana Finnegan. Um, so please, if you'd like to jump in, jump in. Um, also taking into consideration all of the different uh, ways in which Sharon has taken us through, the way in which we have to also think about the negotiations around women in the media in Beijing and what we've been seeing. And thanks again for flagging Walking Into Walls, who's been doing this work for a very, very long time. So opening it up to all of you, please. And you are correct. One of the things that I noted, and I and I, I keep seeing it over and over, is that especially in politics or any woman who comes to a leadership position, one of the things that the media does is that they always have to list that the woman is married and she she has a child or if she's not married she's a single mother and you know it, it's always this personal aspect and 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 they they kind of like single out whether you are married or single versus you have a man who's being appointed and he's doctor mr or doctor tony brown but nothing more is said about him, his family, or anything like that. So there's a lot of disparity between how women are portrayed in the media, whether you are in the, the politics arena or other ways. And, and when you look at women in politics, it's always very personal about the things that they've done, how they dress, you know, where, where they've been, all, all those little personal details that the, the media tends to focus on, and then it gets the public in a frenzy and, and, and women can become very judgmental. So then we begin to say, oh, I, did, I don't like her because she associates with that individual or or she came from a poor family or she's not married and she has a child, how she could talk to me. So things like that, when they, when they print or portray stuff like that, it makes us become more critical versus when you see a man, all you see is this eloquent or this very distinguished gentleman and you, you fall in love with that person versus you falling in love with a woman who has so much more to offer. Thanks, Nicole. And I think a response to that is when you are the woman who is the subject of the interview, in the moment that you're doing the interview and you see the questions very much focused on um, the personal side of you, you redirect. You stay on your message. You've come there to talk about a program or an initiative or a call to action um, for a community, and you, and you keep taking the reporter back to that message. Um, we've done training, you and women, in partnership with Sewell and other uh, seasoned women politicians. We've done training with young women coming into politics, and we try to make them aware of all these things. And in fact, we've seen leaders of political parties tell us that women are, are even more hesitant to enter elective politics because they don't want to go through this scrutiny that men are not put through. But let's also remember that it's not just men putting women through this scrutiny, it's women doing this as well, and we need to change all of those behaviors. And um, as the subject of the interview, you stay on your message, you redirect the report, you redirect the 
the event to what it is you've come to speak about. And if after you've done that, um, the report is still not favorable, then you use these different spaces. You speak to another media house, um, and you don't have to call out the one that was offensive, but you, you go back with your message, and you work with them to get your message out. You can use your personal online spaces to say, I, you know, I want, went to launch so-and-so. I want to speak about this program. It's unfortunate that they chose to focus on these things, but yes, that's a part of me. Um, I'm a whole person doing other things besides the work, but I really want us to focus in on this. This is what we're talking about any moment. This is who it benefits, and this is why it's necessary to focus on this. Um, Elaine, I'm going to put you on the spot. I think that the Grenada uh, Government Information Services is pretty proactive and gives very good coverage, and that when you have events, you get public and private sector media coming out in support, the Grenada Government Information Service Facebook page, website, um, they have videographer, photographer, reporter, everybody on the scene and treat every um, issue and event with, you know, great importance. Hi, good morning. Yes, Sharon, you are right. Um, that is done by the Government Information Service as well as private um, media houses and, uh, and, and personnel here in Grenada. Um, there has been quite a long engagement of the media here on a lot of the issues of gender equality and women's rights. Um, that includes workshops with media personnel. Um, a, a few years ago, well, several years ago, um, some of us had done an assessment of media reports and highlighted to media personnel in Grenada what, um, what we found. It included some of the things you mentioned as part of the media monitoring program. As a matter of fact, many years ago, Grenada was one of the um, countries studied um, and reporting on the um, GMM, GMMP. So um, that engagement has been ongoing for quite some time. And now, sometimes, the media calls on us to be more um, and is expecting us to be more progressive than we perhaps are willing to go even. Um, but the media is, is very much on the ball and, and highlight some of the issues and some of the things and carry some of the messages that sometimes, um, in, in my case, as it, in the gender machinery, we cannot carry. The media actually does a very good job in highlighting some of the issues. Thanks, Elaine. Do we have any, um, I see Lana Finnegan gave the comment about the Twitter, and I, I reiterate that Jamaica Twitter is incredible and so alive and so active, um, and they, have, they definitely have a good engagement with the media houses. They call them out on Twitter if they see something they don't like. The media houses, you'll see managers using their personal accounts responding to some of these issues, so we want to try to be in the spaces where the media managers are and also to call them into our spaces. Of course, when you're going to be using personal accounts, you have to be careful. Um, and you may have to have a more personal personal account. That's not as visible um, if there are other things you want to talk about. But if, the minute you mix your personal account with your organizational issues, um, there are going to be codes and, and, and ethics and standards that you have to adhere to as well. This is Nolisa Lord from um, Grenada. I'm sitting along together with Miss McQueen. Um, however, Pascal. and Miss Pascal, Miss Jacqueline Pascal, Loris Pascal, of course, is here. Um, my comments I would like to make is in regards to, for Grenada, I agree with what Miss McQueen said and the fact that we basically have it undercovered with, in terms of how women is portrayed in the media, but. Our issue, I would say, and which probably is globally as well, is around carnival time, when the music is being produced. You hear a lot of the language that is being spoken, or the way in which women are portrayed, or the way um, there's sexual connotations 
in regards to how women are portrayed or, or the manner in which the women are degraded sometimes. Um, I think that's an issue that probably needs to be t taken up in the future, whether it be having to sensitize more wrong our culture, um, maybe the choice of words and the value that they give to women. And I think it's not just Grenada, but globally. I mean, you hear it in Trinidad, um, many of the other Caribbean islands, when you're around carnival time, the way the music is, is, is being created is usually putting women in a subjective position and it's always the man giving her something, you know, give her wood from the back or, you know, and it's always, and these are things that are actually being, you hear them singing it and not often persons come forward and address it or there's not much training around having to structure music and the lyrics of the music and the way in which the, the music come across for women. Um, I think women themselves also need to stand up for themselves and say, look, I'm not standing for this. I'm not going to support it. I'm not going to participate unless some of the lyrics change because we could have good, clean music. We could have it as wild as we want, but at the same time, just having to respect women and the way they wish we portrayed. And um, that's my contribution. Thank you. Um, some years ago when we were still UNIFEM, um, we did a workshop in, in Trinidad with radio announcers, um, people who would be choosing the music that they play, and we went through an exercise where we um, dissected some lyrics and looked at the messaging and asked persons how they felt about what was being said and what did they think it was saying to um, society and so on. And so that was a good first step in terms of awareness, but that's something that needs to be sustained and you need to do it. We then did it later on, several years later as UN Women, we did it with music producers, we did it with actual singers, and we tried to reach those who had a, a good following um, in the sense that if they're popular and we're able to have that success with them and, and, and um, have them as ambassadors for the change that we want to see, um, that would be a good step. But we need to ensure that as we do this, that we have the resources to sustain this engagement, that we have the resources in the instances where they want to do um, outreach at carnivals or festivals, that we can support them to do this. So that's, that's something you can think about. Um, certainly carnival time is a time when we're very concerned about how vulnerable women and girls are, not just in terms of the lyrics, but in terms of the alcohol that's being consumed, in terms of the harmful social norms that might be amplified around that time. Um, we had one artist here in Barbados, uh, Michael Mercer. He does self-defense training pardon me, ahead of the local uh, crop over festival in Barbados for women and girls. He does that at one of our secondary schools because he recognizes um, that vulnerability and that's part of his contribution, apart from also doing advocacy during his uh, radio segment during the festival. So that's something you could think about working with artists. Um, as you said, there are women artists who who don't tolerate this, who don't in any way sing these type of lyrics. Sometimes their songs themselves are condemning the behaviors and the lyrics. And, and how can you partner with them um, to reach to the radio stations or to get interviews on TV or engage with the media in some way to share that message of why um, this type of lyric and this type of uh, bent is so harmful to women and harmful to all of us, really, um, because as you know, toxic masculinity harm men and boys as well, not just women and girls. And I'm happy that um, you raised this bill, that you raised the um, issue about lyrics and so. And what we need to do is really listen to the lyrics because sometimes the music is so infectious. You go dancing, whining, whatever, and then you say, wait, what does he say in it? And then you realize that you're really enjoying something that you are really opposed to. So we really need to, to listen to the lyrics sometimes. To, you know, just to, to hold on, I can't find the word, but, you know, the importance of listening to the lyrics and what is being said when 
the music wants to drive you another way. Thanks, Jackie. Um, there are times when um, I, I have stood still and not danced a particular song and friends will ask and they're like, do you think you're carrying your work too far? And I say no, because it's not just my work. Um, this is about how I live my life and what I stand for. And so, no, I don't put down the work and then come and um, encourage negative behaviors. Um, it's something you have to be conscious of all the time. We have a few comments online. Nicole Aline says, the Business and Professional Women's Club of Barbados has a fairly good relationship with the media houses. In recent times, any time there's a DV case, they have called to investigate and were a lot more vigilant and sensitive to what information they would print and would often ask what's the uh, correct wording. And certainly that's a valuable relationship and important that they are asking how can they cover the story but not do further harm and that you're able to support them in that. Maya shares with us um, in terms of training in new media spaces, can CXC and teachers be partners to integrate with digital media curriculum? I think, um, I'm not expert on that, I'm not sure, but I think that that this Are you asking if they are teaching this or if they can be partners to to work with media houses? Maya, if you could just clear that up. Okay, Maya's, Maya's giving us a little more detail. She's saying if these teachers um, who are in the CXC programs for technology and digital media can be partners, she's making a suggestion that they can be partners to work with so that the young producers of media have a grounding in the topics that are raised. Um, there are many women who lead guest columns throughout the region, many of which address gender. How can they be better shared across the region, especially since many are not aligned with uh, government papers? So folks, it's in terms of us using this opportunity of this course as well to share our different social media handles and spaces so that we can follow each other and we can repost and we can push out this information um, even further, um, as Maya is suggesting. Women are already doing this work, but as I said, because it's sometimes gender and, and gender equality and women are treated, um, their barriers around the message being widely shared, then we have to work to push this out even further. Yes, Maya is reminding us of the CGAD. CGAD, you know, biannually brings excellent um, resource people together who um, have great projects during the CGAD and as well the work that they take back up when they go back home. And that's, that's information that we need to be aware of and to be able to share as well and act on. But in terms of, of your negotiating, um, has anyone thought of lang specific languaging that they want to see included um, in the negotiations around how the media responds to women, um, to gender equality? Have you started to think about language in terms of where those regulatory boards are not in place and 25 years later you're not able to check many of the areas under women and the media, is there a need for some definitive language to say um, this is needed because we want to commit to this, this is what we want to follow up on immediately afterwards, and in, and in the period following, have you started to think about that language that you should include about women in the media and not only address it when you're doing the reporting? And Maya's already saying that that GMMP data um, was quite interesting and, and she would be able to act on that information um, to reach out to potential partners. So the link for the GMMP is in the PowerPoint that you'll get and you can spend some more time going through it and seeing what other valuable information is in there that you can use for either evidence-based policy making or you can use for um, supporting partners in developing codes of practice. 
Um, there was some work with, I think it was the UNESCO, um, sometime when they said there were about 12 Caribbean countries that had signed on to um, develop to, about codes of practice and they had instituted gender focal points. I'm going to look back and just see if I could find those media houses for you and if they're in your countries, you can reach out to them and see if they still have the gender focal points. Um, in St. Lucia in 2018, CAFRA had hosted a training program for media practitioners to sensitize and help improve the image of women in the media, and that would have been in St. Lucia. Um, were you able, St. Lucia participants, did you know about this training, and were you able to see any difference in the media coverage, any um, positive impact of the training? Do you know if training has continued? Or anyone else who wants to, to continue to the discussion and make a comment? Yes, yeah, Sharon, thanks for asking. Um, good morning, all. During the Global Media Monitoring Project <clears throat> in the earlier days, we um, were given funding to meet with the local um, persons from the different media spaces whether it was written or songs or calypso or different forms. Um, what happened is that they sent persons who were not of the decision-making level. So no um, firm decisions could have been made there as to words going forward. In addition to that, our media association is not functioning as um, we would like it to function, but we have developed a relationship with them, and they are always willing to um, work along with us with any issue, whether it's a preventive issue or an issue in which a matter, um, for example, is written in the local newspapers. So um, there is also ongoing discussions um, about the, the codes. There is the great concern about um, freedom of expression as to who will be enfranchised and who will be disenfranchised. So those are some of the challenges that we continue to work through, but the relationship with the media association is still very strong. Thanks, Alexandrina. Um, thanks so much for that, that input. There are lessons in there for all of us. And then there are also challenges that I'm sure all of us have confronted or will confront at some point in time. And we need to, to have those honest discussions where we speak about freedoms, but if someone's freedom is, is prohibiting someone else's, then how far can we really go? We need to ensure um, safety of all um, in what we're doing. We have a comment um, that, yes, the system Trend Theatre Collective Groups, Jamaica, through Waru Commission and CSW LAC. Congo Committee is pulling together our statement and they're going to share it with us. It's not just about the media, but it's around the theme. And really those NGO, the NGO statements um, in preparation for CSW, they hold quite valuable information um, and strategies and we, we we, we can, you know, learn a lot from these, and so we're looking forward to, to seeing that. I think it's Lana that would have shared that with us. We're looking forward to seeing that. Um, Jackie has told us that the network, uh, Jackie, just, just type and tell us which network it is. Sorry, not coming to mind right now, has been a part of the first two global media monitoring projects, and that they're also going to be involved in the upcoming exercise for the 2020 um, one-day monitoring network of NGOs of Trent and Tobago for the advancement of women. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Elaine again. Just in terms of a success, um, just a few years ago, there was um, a, a march in Grenada on an issue of violence against 
women and girls that was actually led by members of the media. They actually encouraged I will sort our um, participation and support, as well as the support of other members of the media and other um, stakeholders in the community. And basically, with you know, led that whole push to for some action to be taken, especially in relation to sexual violence against children. Um, so that I think is one example of a good um, story for us in terms of how the media is engaged in, in the work. But currently, there is another um, example in, in progress, actually, of how engaged the media is in assisting with monitoring and advocacy around sexual violence in Grenada, and um, especially social media. But it's also on the radio. Um, where through call-in programs and, and the spaces for people to share their voices on, the, on radio and in social media. And um, it is highlighting the issue even further than um, those of us in offices can take it. And, and so these are just two examples I wanted to share. Thanks, Elaine. And, and call-in programs and community radio are are powerful influencers. Um, they have great audiences who tune in every day um, and who are quite active in their engagement. And these are good spaces to, sh to share your message. But even if you're just at your desk and able to listen to the, you know, you sort of have it on in the background, um, you're able to monitor in that way. So not that I know not everyone has the time to specifically stop and focus, except it's a, a day when they are perhaps targeting your department or ministry or your issue or your NGO or so on, where you, you're going to come in and, and do a direct response. Um, other days, you may just have it on in the car as you're driving between um, events, and you just try to keep track in your mind some of what you're hearing, and, and if it's anything you think you need to raise perhaps in an engagement with them through training, or if you do that courtesy call, or if you get that moment um, to speak to that managing director. Sharon, I'm seeing a few more comments. Alicia is aware of an initiative of that the director of the National Gender Machinery in the Bahamas, Dr. Higgs, is working on with a member of civil society to work with women in the media in the Bahamas and highlight them as well as working with them to sensitize them to the issues. While writing the Beijing report, she realized it was seriously lacking in that area. I don't think we had any celebrations in that area except for PSAs. Um, uh, Elaine's point as well about the query about censorship versus the freedom of expression re-music. Jackie clarified it's the network of NGOs in Trinidad and Tobago for the advancement of women. And um, I think this, this issue that Elaine raised as well is, is something, basically the music is a reflection of what is happening in our society. So how do we manage the conversation? Um, and I think a lot of what you've suggested, Sharon, in your presentation are things that we could look to to start also. I mean, the good thing is that there is Sistrin, there is Groots, there is uh, Women's Media Wash, there is a network of NGOs. There are a lot of people who have been doing significant work on Hello. the media. Uh, so I think we, we do have to look at the fact that in terms of the future the future actions, not only the gender awareness training for the professionals in the new media, there's one other thing we have to also ensure that we too have the media training that is required so that we can we, we get their air as well. Um, and that's something that you had raised, Sharon. So that we are we're we're actually reframing the debate in ways that are constructive and not just when I say constructive, I mean that continue the conversation because often, sometimes, as Elaine said, when we get into the censorship issues, and because our music is a reflection of our culture, it, they, people just think that we're being sensitive. Like when you stop to dancing, or as they they said to you, Sharon, you know, this is this is um, you're taking it too far. 
because this is our culture, but we're not really getting to the root causes sometimes if we can't, we're not trained to have the conversations that then address those root, those root causes. And so that is something that we also need as well. So that's great that that's happening, Alicia, in the Bahamas, um, so that the, the women are sensitized and hopefully they can also sensitize us to, to some of the ways in which even the engagement with the media is changing. And as, as Sharon has said, Jamaica is really at the forefront of this with Twitter and many other things um, so that we can be at the head of framing the debate. Because often the debate is framed and then we come in and we're trying to reframe it rather than being at the, the forefront of reframing what is how what we talk about is being discussed. Are there any other questions for Sharon? Um, any other thoughts? I mean, and I think thanks as well, Alicia, for talking about how this is reflected in the Beijing reports, which Sharon also spoke to, um, and what we're going to want to be thinking about with regards to a Caribbean position moving forward. Tony Alexandrina noted in the chat, um, working with bands on the road is also very helpful. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Sorry, didn't see that, Alexandrina. Yes. And I think one other thing that, that we do need to flag is that sometimes when, and this is a difficult one for all of us, is people assume they know what many of us are going to say, either by virtue of what our organization is or the fact that we have been in the media before. So how can we ensure that there are many spokespersons saying um, many things in ways that resonates? So Dorothy said one important thing is we're not looking at is how women also work against women through the media. Um, yes, and so Sharon has said, Dorothy, can you give more detail or examples? I think one of the greatest lessons learned in the work on gender equality is just because someone is a woman does not mean that they are in any way gender responsive or believe in gender e equality because they are also products of the society in, with, in which we are raised. So... Um, there will be a lot of women who too are perpetuating some harmful gender stereotypes, uh, not because they're necessarily malicious, but because this is part of how they've grown up and what they believe to be true. So we do, I think that work that is happening with women in the media is critical, as well as the work that is happening with women in civil society so that we can better understand and, and work against this. So some of the most devastating life cyberbullying among the ne negative things are often done by women to women. This is true. This is true. And and, and that goes to the, the issue of, of the fact that there are many, just because you're a woman doesn't necessarily mean that you are in any way gender sensitized or believe in gender equality. Um, so, so that is something that we also need to be working on. Sharon, did you yeah. want to speak to that? Yeah, Tony, I think there was a campaign some time back um, where young women were using the internet to run a campaign to show why they were not feminists um, and why they felt feminism was harmful. And you know, when we see these things happening, we, we need to be in the space showing what is the reality of what feminism means, why we work towards gender equality, and not necessarily in a combative way with them, but making sure that our side is visible as well, and not just allowing um, detractors or louder opposition to shut us down, and then that becomes the information that people are seeing and, and believing to be the case because they don't have an alternative, they don't have the facts, they don't have more information being made available to them. So um, Dorothy said we need to educate our women here, and Elaine said sometimes listening to or following the comments in the media, including social media, can be used as research. This way we can examine the kinds of responses, both positive and negative, and consider them in programming. That is true, Elaine, and, and also it is a critical way in which we assess our impact. And one of the things I, I we've been doing at UN Women a lot is looking at if people are still so confused about what gender means and what gender equality means, it means that we have not necessarily been communicating in the way that we 
we could. And that's something that Sharon has been helping us with since 2010, is really figuring out how best to communicate properly. And then also following and listening to the comments in the media to see whether people are actually understanding what we do and why we do it. Um, so that is a very, very good point, uh, Elaine. And just to go back to Sharon's slide nine, where they were looking at, not sorry, not nine, the, the slides that looked at what the regional picture is. And when we look at the news that only 18% of stories made reference to gender equality or inequality, human rights and related policies, that's huge. Um, that's something that is, that's way too low, especially if we believe that you cannot have sustainable development without gender equality. You cannot attain the SDGs, that the violence that we see increasing in our society has a connection, maybe not necessarily a causal connection that we can prove, but definitely a connection with gender inequality. And in terms of challenging or reinforcing gender stereotypes, nearly one in 10 stories challenge stereotypes, and that's only one in 10. So that's those are there, those are really significant data facts that are stark. And then if you go to slide ten, where we're looking at what the country reports are saying, then it's not surprising that the women and girls are presented through a narrow stereotypical lens, um, and that there's this objectification because only one in ten stories are challenging these kinds of things, um, and that the media is one of the institutions that still maintain patriarchy. So. What we're seeing in the reports definitely reflect what the data and evidence is showing about how and what is, is being reported in our media. And it's interesting then to see if the steps that have been taken across all of the countries actually address that. So we have the Electronic Crimes Act, yes, the training of media professionals, but these are on specific topics. Are we also training them on issues regarding gender stereotypes and the importance of gender equality? Absolutely, Lana. All of these the PowerPoints are shared um, by da Daniil. So we, you'll definitely get this stereotype, um, this PowerPoint as well, not the stereotype, but the PowerPoint. Um, that there are some media alliances, but again, around specific days. But how can we maintain this, the, the momentum so that it crescendos around these days, but is not only addressed during these days, because these are probably the days where you get those one in 10 stories or that 18% of the articles. Um, and then the panel discussions and fora, as well as strengthening the TVET program. And this is probably what Maya was speaking to as well with CXC. It's starting them early um, in, in getting this kind of awareness and training done, as well as enhanced access and affordability for the use of ICTs for women so that they can also contribute to the conversation much more. Women talk text and social media training for young girls and women to highlight social media as a vital news source, as well as a space for advocacy. Um, and these are the ways in which our countries have been working on it, but it would be very interesting to see what else needs to be done to to address these gaps that we're all raising because that is then what you'll take to, and I'm not sure what's going to happen in Chile, to be quite honest, um, whether the Santiago meeting will continue on the 4th, given the situation there, but there is clearly going to be a meeting in New York, all things considered and maintaining the same standard that we are right now in March, where we're going to be negotiating what this means and what does what does the Caribbean need to ensure is on the on the agenda so that we address all of these issues that we see here. And Tony, when we speak about these high visibility moments, um, when there's CSW UN women organizes media hours and they usually ask us who's coming from the Caribbean, um, can we get a brief profile on them and would they be willing to talk to the media? I know Gia has done it several times. Um, Shirley Price has done it as well. Um, and other colleagues. And so you can think about this if you're going to be at CSW. You can let us know and, and if you're willing to uh, be part of media interviews. Remember, as you're talking, you're going to have to give the context for your country because you're going to be talking to New York-based 
uh, reporters, and, and you're going to have to give them a little more information than you would do if you were at home speaking to your own reporters. And something we also need to do is, I don't want us to shy away from the terms like gender and human rights and social protection and human security and so on, but we need to explain them. We need to give people examples of what we mean when we talk about social protection systems. Um, what are these income supports that countries provide? who's being covered by them, um, how can they be better improved. When you speak about gender, you restate that you're not just speaking about women and girls, um, you're speaking about how, it, what, how we identify and what we say it means to be a woman or a girl or a boy or a man or uh, whichever identity you choose to uh, identify as, what does this mean? Um, let's get broader, let's, let's um, explain to people, let's educate people on what it is we're talking about, let them see themselves in what we're saying and how they can use this information or action to improve their lives and to improve their communities, to improve their families, their households, and their countries. Hi, hi. good morning, Gia. I just want to make a quick point that I heard mentioned somewhere along the way about alliances, and we have um, the, when I say we have talked about the network of rural women, we have formed uh, an alliance with two of many people and uh, normally work with them when statements are made, media statements that is, so that we are incorporated or get the opportunity to be able to say something about what happening. So I just want to get that. And Tony, we have a note from um, Loris, the need for continuous training of media personnel on their understanding of the concepts of gender balance and gender equality. Example, they assume that the presence of women means gender equality, regardless of their perspective. Thanks, Loris. And that goes back to what Tony was speaking about, that you can't just assume that because it's a woman in this space, it means that she's gender aware and, and, and uh, gender responsive and uh, believing and practicing and living for gender equality. But it also means we need to do the education. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Anything else from, from colleagues on the floor? And then if not, we can wrap up. But if there's anything else, do let us know. This, the media is a critical partner and a critical um, and it, it came out in the country reports. The, the media reproduces um, or whether it is reinforcing or questioning a lot of what our cultures uh, identify as truths. The media is a critical partner in our ability to really achieve gender equality in countries. So this is a critical area of concern that Beijing acknowledged as critical 25 years ago. So we really need to ensure that going forward, we have some very clear guidelines for how we want to engage with the media and how we will engage with the media, um, not only as UN agencies, but also as civil society organizations and national gender machineries or whatever the institutional mechanism is that is promoting gender equality in the country. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jackie. It's a great session. We appreciate it. Thank you, Sharon Carter-Burke, for this. I hope you were able to also share some of your experience at um, Beijing as a young delegate of the, the Barbados government. And I think this is also a flag to all of our government colleagues online to ensure that not only civil society organizations are part of the official delegation, but that young women are also part of the official delegation and young women in the media would also be great to have as part of your official delegations. Sharon, do you wanna say anything before we close? Um, well, on that last point, I didn't actually share on the Beijing experience. Sorry, colleagues. Um, it was quite eye-opening and in some ways overwhelming, and I think that you need a bit of mentoring when you're new to these spaces um, beforehand and then while you're there as well, where people are um, sort of talking you through to an extent what is happening, um, where the different spaces you go into between the official uh, 
meetings, the NGO uh, forum, the other side events that happen, and then also start to think when you're in these spaces, how do you shape what you're going to come back and report on? Because that was also something I had to do, not just from my work perspective, um, do a, a radio program on the, on the conference. I also had to go to an official meeting of the Barbados government to report to the Governor General on the experience of being at Beijing and, and what it meant for the Barbados delegation. And at that time, we were able to um, acknowledge that, you know, there had been lots of gains in, in social legislation that, um, for me, at that young age and that level of exposure, it was surprising that, it, that more countries were not yet at that state. But then it also meant an honest reflection on where um, Barbados was lying, um, what were the gaps and what we needed to do, and the, and the very interesting networks and, and partnerships that you meet when you go into these spaces, um, the very strategic negotiations that you have to be doing um, outside of the meetings and to all hours, as some of you are well aware. Um, but definitely, if you are able, as Tony said, to be a part of that, of your government's delegation, it, it shows um, greater diversity in terms of the voice and perspectives that will be brought to the meeting. It shows that there's inclusivity, that you're not just saying that all the expertise resides with the government, that you are recognizing that within your civil society, within professional areas, um, there's expertise that can be brought to bear. And so I think it was a very good uh, model and example and, and all these years later, still want to say thanks to the IDB for making the opportunity available and to the government of Barbados for saying, yes, um, we recognize you as the IDB Youth Delegate and we are happy to accredit you to our official delegation and have you in these spaces um, with us and to really uh, jumpstart this area of work for me because as a young woman in the newsroom, I was just automatically sent to cover anything that had to do with women and gender, because they were like, oh, you're the woman, go and cover it. Um, no point sending a man. And interestingly, there was a point when a men's organization was trying to start in Barbados, and they sent me to cover, and the men um, in the organization would not let me in. They said they should be allowed to have their own space, and that no women reporters would be allowed into the meeting, which in itself became the story rather than the organization they were trying to create. Um, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, but really, um, I think it, I, I really grew and benefited from that experience and, and certainly want to encourage um, governments where they are able to do so to, to extend um, this inclusion as well. Uh, Lana, thanks so much. Um, yes, it is critical um, on what you do when you get home um, and right at that moment when you get home, how do you start to share information and how do you start to share information and advocate in a way that you can give people a call to action, a way to make the move beyond um, what the government is doing. Elaine, the next session is on Friday, Tony, our, our final session is on Friday. With yes, our final session, just to wrap up, to say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Lana, for saying again how critical what and how you do in these when you get home is. And Elaine, thank you for saying this session has reminded you to engage the media more in public education and the personnel as advocates as well, absolutely. So on Friday, we're going to have a bit of a break. And then the last session is going to be led by Tracy Robinson, and it's on the human rights of women. We're going to be looking at women human rights defenders, the LGBTQI issues, and sexual reproductive health and rights, as well as the girl child. 